heard you like your radio, just like you like your coffee. Today, we're privileged enough to have um, one of the contestants of a political party today. Uh, his name is uh, Gbadabo uh, Patrick Rhodes Vivor. We know that um, they call you JRV. Yeah. Is that okay if we call you that? That's With fine. the question. Why are you running for governorship of Lagos? Um, I'm running, no, I'm involved in politics because I believe that, you know, it's like what Plato says, if you don't get involved in politics, you'll be ruled by people inferior to you. And then you have to deal with those consequences. But aside from that, I, I believe that um, you can only make a change or get involved in something if you truly want that change to manifest around you, you cannot just complain, you cannot just tweet, you cannot just wish these problems away. The problems that we're dealing with in Lagos every day, and I believe that every each each person must be the change they wish to see. And those are just the primary reasons of getting involved, getting in politics, because the whole process of getting to governance, you must go through the political process. You can either get power through the barrel of a gun or to a ballot box and politics is what we've decided to do um, I also believe that it's our time it's time for the people it's time for leadership that puts the people first it's time for servant leaders and that's what the Obidati movement um, the Labour Party movement is about it's about taking power from the status quo and returning it back into the hands of the people. Okay, aside that, what do you think is not working in Lagos that made you say, okay, uh, if I become governor of Lagos, these things would, would, would work better or I would do things differently? Everything. What well, do you everything. mean everything? What is I'll, I'll go into going Okay, this. please. I everything. Like um, from the transportation system where people spend on average two and a half to four hours a day commuting, having to wake up at 4 a.m. in the morning, not really spend time on their kids, getting back around 10 o'clock, not really spend time on their kids. The long-term effect of that is something that this country, is, well, this state in particular is going to regret over the long period, of, over the long term. That's the first thing. You have a situation where the healthcare system is barely functional. You have a situation where education system is subpar. Lagos State used to be called the center of excellence. It was not an accident. You know, and this is the problem. A lot of people don't realize the level that Lagos State was operating at before 1999 and before the military incursion. Lagos State at a point was rated one of the best cities in the world, right? Among the New York, the London, the Sao Paulo, Lagos State was there, right? This is, goes back to like 1966. Lagos State was there. So you have a situation now where Lagos State is ranked one of the worst cities to live in the world consecutively over the last six, seven years. And it's only above war-torn countries, right? Mm -hmm. So these are realities. Unfortunately, people think that it's okay to compare Lagos to other states in Nigeria and say, oh, wow, Lagos is, you know, ahead. Mm -hmm. But Lagos State has always been a city-state. Even back then, historically, it was a protectorate. It was separate, right? And that's why it's called the center of excellence because that's what it was. So we're trying to take Lagos. We're trying to restore the glory back to Lagos and have a situation where everything in the state works and revolves around the people, their interest, what is convenient for them. You know, from policy um imp from policy um processing to policy implementation everything must center the people their quality of life right and we must also have a transparent and accountable lagos because lagos state is one of those states that boast about how much they generate from the people so there must be a social contract you cannot be taking all this money from people and you're not accountable and transparent in your spending and how you relate with them Right? And that's what needs to change because you have situations where bridges or flyovers are be being built at five times the price as to built in Ghana or Ethiopia. And then we still complain that we have infrastructure deficit when truly, you know, we could have had five bridges. If we're dredging, they're doing dredging at cost of almost four or five times what they should actually be. So our waterways could have been dredged properly. And then we can actually stop paying lip service to water transportation. Right? So there is a lot that needs to be done all across all sectors, even in housing, affordable housing, ensuring that affordable housing gets to the people that they're supposed to get to. Yeah, across all sectors, housing, education, transport, urban development, 
um, transparency in form of taxes, creating a situation where people feel the direct benefit of the taxes they pay. You know, everybody in Lagos keeps asking, what are they using our money for? What are they using our money for? And then close to elections, you see they start to commission some token projects, right? Close to elections. But three years before that, you just see stagnancy, right? So we, we, we need to get past all of that. A number of people refer to you as a shining star while you were in PDP. Um, but we also heard that before you left the PDP, you also withdrew from the primaries, the governorship primaries. What exactly happened with that? Okay, so I guess this question will always follow me. <laughs> yes, it will. <laughs> um, so I I was a gubernatorial aspirant in the PDP. Prior to that, I was central candidate in 2019. I uh, had the most opposition votes in Lagos State after Atiku Alaji, Atiku Abubakar. And I had built structures to actually contest a gubernatorial primary. Um, the leaders in my party felt that myself and the eventual flag bearer would make the perfect ticket. Um I'm younger than him, so the, the idea was, okay, you know what, run with him, be his deputy, and then in eight years' time, you can never run for governor, you'll just be 47 then, so you'll still be relatively very young. And, you know, what leaders can see sitting down, you can't really see even if you're standing up. And at the point where all of them came to that consensus, I said, as an Omoluabi, I'll accept. And I did. Unfortunately, those agreements that they made and you know, carried the eventual flag bearer along, were reneged on, right? And I'm not the type of person that just sits sits down when you renege on an agreement to me. So I'm a very persistent person, mm -hmm. you know, so I chase my ambition on another platform. Okay. Was it not scary for you knowing that, okay, I, I, I know that you came out as a local government chairman with COA party at yeah. some point, yeah. and then uh, with PDP, and it's also in Lagos since uh, 2009, that's Lagos has no. I mean, since two thousand and nine, uh, Lagos has been uh, an opposition, okay. uh, an APC or AC or AD state, mm -hmm. and then uh, you have always gone with the opposition. Is there is there reason to that? Oh yes, um, everything that I do not like about Lagos, everything that is not functioning in Lagos, all the ills of Lagos are, are the creation of the ruling party. Right, so I'm not an opportunist. I'm not somebody that just, you know, is looking for what is in it for me. I'm in politics because of principle and ideology. So you always find that, yes, there have been movements, but it's always against the ruling party because I believe that they have run Lagos in a very irresponsible way. I mean, from the murder of Funcho Williams to um, just how thugs and how how there's a fourth arm of government that are what they call the agbiros that have been empowered by the state they are backed by the state um to just everything that's going on the level of inefficiency the level of corruption the level of greed which is what is stifling lagos I, I cannot i cannot i cannot join the apc so you always find me in opposition to that because genuinely that's why i'm in politics i'm in opposition to the ills of Lagos State. And I'm an image of Lagos. I have no other place really to call home. So we must get it right. Mm. And moving to the Labour Party, why exactly the Labour Party? I mean, we have other parties um, in the country. But yeah. why did you have to choose to go to LP? Yes, there, there are two reasons. The first reason, one, Labour Party is a party that actually has ideology, right? You'll be very surprised when you're dealing with um, party leaders they are very ideological driven ideologically driven so you find i mean they are the unions right and there's social welfareism in the ideology um there is it's all about the people i mean it's one party where you know you have the logo literally represents the people you see father papa mama picking as we call it right and then peter b phenomenon just him coming in to the party and even because i joined quite early the 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 the, um, the movement had not been this energized as it is today, but I I I appreciate and I relate directly with what um, His Excellency Peter B stands for, which is you know a phobia for waste, a desire to run a government efficiently, a desire to put the people first, and a desire to actually manage resources. 
right? As opposed to just wastefulness that has come to typify our political class. And that's something I, I genuinely um, relate to it. And so it was, I felt it was a very easy decision to make. Hi, good morning, welcome. Yeah. Well, well, I greet you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. My name is Onye I'm calling from Mikorodu. All right, okay. Onye go ahead. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. First of all, I want to ask some questions. First, now, I share in and then say the Labour Party wants to do running tomorrow. How you people are preparing on it? Because some news that I hear, they say they ban them to go to one side or go to the other place, but then keep them from safety. How you people are going to handle survival and the security of those and how then we guide themselves so that nothing will happen to them? Um, the Labour Party march is happening tomorrow. Um, the Obidati march is happening tomorrow in four different locations. One is happening, the, the central location is Surulere National Stadium. And then another one is happening at Ikeja at Archbishop Vining. The second is, the third is happening in Festac FHA um, field. And the fourth is happening at Lekki Phase 1, opposite Lekki Gate. That's where they're converging from 7 a.m. in the morning. Now, the Commissioner of Police has agreed to provide um, protection for all these locations. Um, a, a group, the Lambert Network of Lawyers for Bola Ahmed Sinubu, um, initiated a motion in court to try and stop this rally from happening. Unfortunately, the court ruled in our favor and said we can march, right? And in Lekki, we are not... Com we never even had plans to converge at Lekki toll gate. What makes you think it uh, made them to think that you wanted to converge there? They just used that as an excuse. And that's why we got a very... Um, a ruling that came out very quickly. You know, they wanted to use an excuse to tie the violence that happened in the aftermath of the army doing what they did at Lekki Gate and the aftermath of that to this rally, right? And they have nothing in common. October 1st is the Day of Independence, right? Mm -hmm. So the judge said, and we never plan to converge at Lekki Gate, but the judge said, you know, you can pass through like to, which was our plan all along. That was the route to go from Lekki Phase 1 and they're going to Falamo. Mm. So that was going to happen. So the police and security agencies, even the judge mandated that we write security for us. And we've, spoke, we've spoken to the Commissioner of Police, we've met with him, and security is going to provide it. So please, nobody should be afraid, nobody should be intimidated. Lagos State is our state, it's our Lagos. So please come out, you know, and we're going to have a very peaceful rally and just move around Lagos and just show solidarity. Hello, good morning. Good morning to you all. This is Mazi online. All right, welcome, Mazi. Quickly, go ahead. Thank you very much. Uh, the Labour Party candidate, good morning, sir. Good morning, sir. Thank uh, you for calling. You've answered the first question on the, the, rally. the rally tomorrow. But this issue, people say Labour Party has no structure. I don't understand what they mean, no. so maybe you can elucidate on that so that we know. And if it is true, or if there's anything lacking, what are you doing as to fill them? Two, okay. Labour Party planned a rally in Kaduna, Air Five stopped it. What is the plan of, uh, of having the rally in Kaduna in another day? Thank you very much, and good morning again. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the idea of structure in Nigerian politics must be understood. The, the structure that exists in Nigerian politics today really is about sharing money. And How uh, do you mean by that? Yes, because unfortunately, our politics has been monetized significantly. So you have structures to get the money down to the ballot boxes, to the polling units, to the area boys, to all the bribery and all the corruption that comes along with it that's what essentially the structure is used for and that's all well and good like you know we know they give shishi <laughs> <laughs> yes uh, but, that's but that's one of your slogans that's one of our slogans yeah. but also we match it to reality as well but let's 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 be serious here um we have the people 
The people are on our side. The people are organizing themselves. They've left the politicians behind. They are moving. And that's what democracy is supposed to be. You have the people um, autonomously organizing. You have people autonomously mobilizing themselves. And they are not looking for... They are mobilizing without being mobilized by politicians. And that is really where it's at. It's about the people. And all we have to do right now is bring those people into positions. Right? We don't have to preach. Like right now, talking about Labour Party to people is... We are preaching to the choir. The people are already ready. They are determining the direction that they are going to go. We just now... We are organizing them. And that's the work we are doing in the party with the chairman... Um, Comrade Salako and the entire party ESCO in the state. We are and support groups, so many of them. We are bringing all of them in, putting them down in the polling units, putting them down ward structures, putting them down in local government structures, and training them for what is going to come in uh, 2020. Mm. You would agree with me that, you know, sadly in Nigeria today, the government is actually looking at, you know, social amenities as a favor to the people where yes. you, we see you know, flyovers, and then they think that's what the people actually need. Now, they neglect some certain parts of, you know, the people's life. Now, coming in as, you know, if elected, rather, if elected as the governor of Lagos State, what would you do different, you know, as regards an average Lagosian's life? How how do you want them to survive? Let's not talk about amenities. And also, you, you mentioned something about transportation. What would you do different? Because right now, I think that's one of the most congested sector in Lagos State. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think that the first, your first, the part of your first part of your question, talking about how government feels they are doing the people a favor, yes, is a very very important factor to understand. Now, when a government believes that they buy their way into power, and it's, they see consistently that voter turnout is only 17 percent and out of that 17 percent they get maybe 11 or 12 percent and they know how much they've spent they know what they spent to get that you are getting rulers you're not getting leaders or servant leaders so every time they do something for you they feel that they're doing you a favor right everything that they do is to continue to protect their position in power and empower their underlings to also continue to hold structure and hold forth so that they will maintain power. It's never really been about the people, right? And that's also in part because the people have not really turned out. You know, if you have less than 1 million people coming out to vote in a place that has 6 million registered voters, the politician would reflect your seriousness or lack thereof. Right, so it's, it's, it's beholding on not just the politician, but the politician is a reflection of those that take politics seriously. Right, so if the people that take politics seriously are the Ialojas and the NRTW people that they might not necessarily care about manifesto or a greater vision and they just want to keep the system going, the politician that would emerge will reflect that. Right, and when he does something like a flyover, he'll be like, Look at, I did this, I'm doing you a favor. I'm working. Or if he brings in secondhand um, train carriages from somewhere in America on a train track that was done by Good Luck Jonathan many years ago to as a political gimmick, and all of you clap, yeah, yeah, look at it. I've done this. So I'm doing you a favor. But to your other question, what will I do different? Yes, first of all, the only, the only a number of other things. Um, the only way that the Labour Party can emerge victorious in the next election is by the people. It's by the people coming out and being determined to say, this is the party that wants to make the next ruling party. So we are indebted to the people. So we must work for the people as servant leaders. Now, in relation to transportation, we and I particularly, my government thinks very systematically. So urban planning, affordable housing, and quality of infrastructure are all tied in together, and I'll explain. First, you start with the roads and the portals. Why are portals constantly coming up on roads? Why are roads being done in Lagos and they only last for six months, and when rainy season comes, it washes it again? So there are scams and rackets that are being done by this government, which is repeating a road construction every six months, when we should set standards, right, and make sure that 
those rules meet certain standards and must have a certain lifespan so that we get the quality for the money and not just the quality of the money, the opportunity cost in terms of time and inconvenience that we give all those people that live around there when we are working on that road. So we must ensure that we are using quality materials and we set a standard and a lifespan for any road work that we do. That's the first thing. The second thing is we must enforce and train our enforcement officers and also have a ring of surveillance so that when an enforcement officer is not doing what he's supposed to do, they'll be held accountable. When a downfall driver is parking and creating a bottleneck on a road, they'll be held accountable. And they must be this policy must be done hands in hands with them. So there's a policy of take. There must be distinct place where they get off the road and park. They cannot just park indiscriminately on the road because that one position then creates back a backlog of traffic. Right? Now, thirdly, we must run a transparent government so that people can see how much it costs to build infrastructure. That way, the government can be held accountable because people come out and say, listen, this thing should be done for this price. This is not really the price of cement or iron rods. This is the price that it should be. That way, even without the governor saying, the entire government system will now be have to be, you know, at a certain level and operate on check because nobody wants to be embarrassed, right? So it then creates a life of its own. Um... Fourthly, we must now, the government's role must be to enable the private sector to come into infrastructure development without trying to control or hold on to revenue making parts of infrastructure development. It must not be me or my family member that is in control of the toll gates or the BRT or any of these things. Let the private sector come and create an enabling environment and I promise you we can have 10 bridges across the water systems that we have in Lagos State. The private sector is eager to come in, but the kickbacks that are demanded of them, the rules that are demanded of them, so people go as far as even asking for 40% of their company to get these projects. And then they just turn it down. So we have a situation where we can even build four or five bridges because the population in Lagos makes these type of projects feasible, right? Especially when the government is not getting in the way. And you look at London, London has over 32 bridges you know, connecting it in between, like, the, with the Thames River. And you have less than 8 million people that live in London. We have 22 million people here and barely have three, four bridges. So we must have a lot more. We must interconnect Badagri Division to Central and Central to Lagos East, right? And make sure Lagos itself is much more connected. That way people, businesses can then go. So you are now doing urban planning. So this comes into the urban planning part. Hello, good morning. Uh, good morning. Now, Mazi again. Uh, let the, the commission candidate not forget uh, my question about Kaduna. Okay, about Kaduna. Okay, all right, no problem. Oh, yes, yeah. please. Uh, right. so, thank, thank you very so much. much. So, I am contesting for Lagos. Yes. I cannot speak authoritatively about what is going to happen in Kaduna. Um, I'm, I will look into it, and I'm sure a statement will be released as soon as possible. All right, so I have this question for you while we wait for the callers to come through. Uh, these things seem easy to be said. Like, I remember when the uh, the APC government was coming into power as presidency, they said a lot of these things. Uh, but then when you get into power, you realize that you have a, a lot to deal with, most especially corruption. Because yeah. when you fight corruption, it fights you back. I usually say that. Now, how do you think... Uh, if elected into uh, uh, the office, how do you think you can handle these things? Because all these things you're talking about, you mentioned all uh, 40% of the company and all of this, they are corruption yeah. methods. How do you think you intend to fight these people? All right, before you answer that question, please. Hello, good morning. Um, Duka, good morning. Good morning, welcome. What is your name? Um, yeah, good morning. This is uh, David from Uganda. All right, welcome, David. Go ahead. Uh, officer, good morning, sir. Um, good morning, uh, sir. Yeah, I, I, I've been listening to you, good policies in Labour Party, but I have a question. Now, I've been listening to you and I've been listening more. You've been talking about what you do in the urban regions, urban regions, urban regions. That's what I've been hearing. My question is, what are your plans in Labour Party to take this policies, this campaign, to the rural areas, these water areas, now, because this is where the real politics are being played. They are for for politics. So apart from the urban areas that you've been highlighting upon, what are your major plans in taking this campaign to the rural areas where about 40% of the vote 
have been wrong where this other party PDP and sorry, APC sorry are just so I can control. so I can answer your question um clearly. All right. Where are the rural areas in Lagos that you are in particularly interested in? No, it's a, no it's a, the question is the way you are talking, you are just centering more on Lagos. Now, yeah, because I'm the governorship so candidate. I'm the governorship are, candidate for Lagos. I'm not a labor officer. I'm the governorship uh, candidate for Lagos. No, but I'm asking a general question. What are the plans of Labor Party taking these things to the rural area? That is my question. Okay. All right. Okay, thank you very much, David. Maybe he's talking about the rural areas in Lagos. Across areas, uh, no, so he, the rural areas in Lagos, yes. places where you have to uh, take canoe to. Yes, those uh, are yes. the water, the, water, water, water. Uh, the riverine areas yes. in Lagos State. I mean, yes. it, these are places that we are going to go to, right? We have people. There are polling units there. We have people at every polling unit in Lagos. We have structures that are going to get there. So these messages will be taken down and be distilled. Obviously, what I'm speaking on radio will be different from what I'll be speaking in the grassroots sort of engagement, right? And if we're going to talk generally about Nigeria and rural areas in Nigeria, there is a structure, right, that's supposed to take these messages down. We saw what happened in Joss when um, Peter B flagged off. We saw yes. the amount of people that came out, right? These are people that are directly responding to this message. Now, you, you see, people like to take away agency, from individuals because of voter apathy. Let, let me explain. People believe that the politician must go and convince people, not understand that the people too have intelligence of their own and they know what is good for them, right? And they are seeing, they are listening, they are hearing, right? I promise you that Peter B or Labour Party agents might not have seen half of the people that turned out for him. They might not have directly engaged with them. But they are monitoring what is going on. They are experiencing the hardship of Nigeria and the pains that they are dealing with. And like I said, this movement is a people movement. It's a movement that is being energized by the people. It's not in the hands of the politician. And that's what makes it so powerful. So, in getting to rural areas, campaigns have started. There are plans to get there. There are structures that are going to be unleashed on all of these places, right, to ensure that the maximum number of votes can be acquired from all of these places. All right. Um, you asked the question. Yes, back to my back question on. and how you t intend to deal with... Uh, yeah, so corruption yes. fighting back. Yes. I feel that when you want to fight something like corruption, you must lead by example. You see, um, Alaji Latif Jankode was able to achieve so much in four and a half years because he shunned corruption. His son was not trying to be the owner of this in Lagos, so he trying to be on the board of something in Lagos. It was about the people. He, his whole focus was, how can I achieve this policy in the fastest possible time, you know, at the cheapest possible price for the maximum amount of people? And you saw it in the education system. You saw it in the affordable housing system. You saw it in the healthcare system that he set up. All across multiple sectors in Nigeria. And I promise you, you know, he started the Light Rail project, Unfortunately, um, the current president, Buhari, stopped it. But I promise you, if he, had, if he had been led to execute that, he would have finished that project in three, four years, max. But now we've built, what, 12 kilometers in like 10 years or something, or even more, more years. So it's about commitment to people. And when leadership shows that, you, you cannot have a leader that is not corrupt and then the civil service wants to be corrupt. You know, you must come in and... Be transparent, be accountable, and then you must now demand those um, qualities from the people in government. Be, be no, any other political party since 2009 has won Lagos State. Mm. What makes you feel a Labour Party can do different? Well, because every, every political party, every power hegemony has its time. Right? All across the world, there are patterns. You see, every 20 years, a revolution will come up and switch it up because a new generation comes of age that has different interests that speaks that wants something different right it happened to the pdp in 2015 right and you find it the people that are empowering empowering this obedient movement are people that you know they are fed up with the status quo they are fed up with politicians that have acquired so much wealth through ill means or using their influence to amass wealth and then use it to seek even more power they want a situation where integrity matters. They want a situation where you have a vision. They want a situation where you want a leader that is healthy, that you can be proud of when he's on a global stage. They want a leadership that, you know, puts them first. And that is missing from political elites in Nigeria. The general political elites, the story is you make a lot of money and you use your money to buy your way into power. 
and that's what we're moving away from. From 1983 to now, it's just uh, you're not 40 yet. No, 39. Yeah, 39. So by next year, you'll be 40. And life begins. And life, life begins at 40. So now I'm looking at it from the position where they say, all right, uh, these people that you have to hustle with for 2023 are older. And you mentioned something what an older person sees sitting down, a younger person might not see even when they climb the, the highest building in the world. Mm-hmm. How do you intend to, you know, to deal with that for people who have been in this uh, um, struggle for years and that you started in 2016, right? Yes. If I'm right, started from 2016. How do you go head to head with these kind of people. All right, so before you answer that question, we also have somebody similar to that. Um, there's a WhatsApp message here. Um, your number ends with 9014. He says, did you just say he was born in 1983? Does he not think age matters when running for the office of the government? Does it matter? It doesn't matter. I mean, you've had people presidents in their 20s. Look over the world, see what happened in Kenya recently. Not just with the president, but the governor of the biggest of the state capital. You have look at how this Macron is president of France, one of the leading world powers in the world. And even aside from that, let's come back to Nigeria. A lot of these people that are holding on to power for their dear lives, they started when they were young in their thirties, right? Go on was president, I think what, in his twenties? Yes, twenty nine. Twenty nine. He was president of Nigeria in during wartime. Yeah. Right? Yes. Now the issue that we've had in Nigeria is that you have a situation where people that got into power early and were given that privilege do not want to get off the stage. So now it makes people that are coming on that stage or trying to come on that stage, which they got on at my age, now look like they are young. But we are not young. We are 40. 40. You've lived half of your life already. You've accumulated a lot of experience. You literally represent the largest voting bloc in the country demographic wise and that's what democracy is supposed to be it's supposed to reflect the demography of the country right so for me what matters the most in leadership especially in nigeria intellectual capacity which is something our political elite have been very bereft of for a very long time because the people that actually value those things don't get involved in politics right they left politics just for the people that you don't want to harvest money every four years with their pvcs right and unfortunately we've seen where that has gotten us as a country right there was a time in 2015 where people were saying they don't care whether the president has or the candidate or for presidency has a nepa certificate as a certificate they're going to vote for him either way now i hope they're happy with where that has gotten us right because intellect and intellectual capacity matters it's not just about popularity contest to win an election you do that for one year then you have three years to actually govern And you must govern, you need the intellectual capacity. And another thing, you need empathy. You need a situation where there is a love for your people. You take pride in not doing them a favor, but by delivering good governance and improving the quality of their lives. Like that is what drives you. You see it with people like, like, like I've highlighted before, Relative Jack on You see it with people like Obafemi Awolo. You see it with politicians that we're still talking about today. They lived for the love of their people. And that's what they did, right? And that's why we're still talking about them today. Are you not scared? Like looking at the power and the people that you have to face, uh, are you not scared that at some point, because some of these politicians can go the extra mile to make sure that uh, uh, the young Badebo doesn't exist or Mm cease to exist. Are you not scared of all of these things coming your way as well? I, I, well, power is not a kid's game, you know, and I, I don't, for me, it's not about fear. I'm not afraid. I, I believe that we have to be in it to change. Hello. All right. Hello. Good morning. Yeah, good morning. Welcome. What is your name? Yeah, my name is Nathaniel. I should ask the question about the age thing. Ask the question about the age thing on the WhatsApp. Oh, you don't understand the WhatsApp message. Okay, the age. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. about the age. Yeah. Okay. okay. I want to know what leadership position has he ever occupied and how long. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank Thank you you very much. In terms of leadership positions, I graduated from MIT, which at the time was the best university in the world. At that time, and shortly after, I worked with the United States government um, to solve the Hurricane Katrina problem in terms of housing. I worked with Chinese government to solve the problems that they had in relation to mass housing and um, 
and the whole loss of the culture that they used to have with the traditional housing, right? I've worked in architectural firms, delivered on very solid projects. I've been involved in activism, fighting for almost three years with the government in relation to policies that were bringing in that were anti-people. Alaji Latif Jakonde is the best governor that Lagos has produced in recent times. He rose to a level in journalism. He was, he was never in position in government, right? He was never in position in government when, before he became governor. He was in politics and then became governor. Until date, what he has achieved in four and a half years, all these experienced politicians have not, experienced in, have not delivered in over 20. So what are we saying? Right? This is that narrative that allows for the status quo to continue. And we are tired of the status quo. He might not be, but I am, and I represent a great deal of people that are tired of that status quo. So for him, if he feels that, then he can... I mean, that's why it's democracy. He has a vote. He can vote for people that he, feel, he feels are experienced and can carry on what Nigeria is if he's happy with what Nigeria is. I'm talking to people that are not happy with what Nigeria is, that feel that Nigeria is performing way below where they should be. A country that is literally bankrupt and has to borrow to be able to pay salaries, right? That produces crude oil but is importing diesel. If that is not a failed country, I don't know what is. I mean, it really frustrates me when you find people that are justifying this suffering and status quo. And what is dangerous about this is, in that 10, 20 years, our population is going to hit 400 million. And if we are constantly being run by people that don't see that this, the way we are running this government is inefficient, people are in poverty, right? At that point, Nigeria will become ungovernable. Because you are not providing jobs. You are not creating enabling environments for businesses to come and invest and create jobs. And then you now start to find lots of young people without any jobs on the street. And then they form their own government and enforce it with violence. And which is what we we started to see across northern Nigeria. Oh, so All right, you, um, uh, you, you know when we talk about the economy and improving the lives of Lagosians, we cannot take away, you know, the the very important factor as security. Yes. Now, uh, what's your take on state policing? Because we've had it over time where people are deliberating on it, and the federal government has not yet paid so much attention, you know, to state policing. Is this something that you would actually, you know, focus on, or do you think Lagos is far better the way it is in? in Oh, no, security. No, no. no, you see, we must achieve restructuring of this entity called Nigeria. Whether we are going to do it incrementally, like somebody that I really look up to in this regard is um, Mr. The, His Excellency of Ondo State, um, Rotimi Akiri Dulu. He's somebody that has sacrificed his own political ambitions for the love of his people in, in relation to securing them. Like pushing for Amoteku. He did not do it half. He was not playing politics with it. He realized that his people's lives were, you know, on the line. And he fought for to establish the Amoteku Corps. Now he's fighting to ensure that they are properly armed or at least as armed as the people that they are fighting against. And this is where we must get to. You know, we are running this country as though it's still... You know, the way the country is structured at the moment is pretty much like what the British put in place. Because the British was believed in a central command, right? And that way they could enforce and suppress from a central position. And we call ourselves a federal, a federal state. So state units must operate autonomously, right? As much as they can. So, so state police is extremely, extremely important. They call the governor the chief security, security officer of the state. So if you are the chief security officer of the state, you must have people that are security forces that are answerable to you, that work directly with you, not with the person in Abuja. And if we've copied the American system, then we should copy it in its entirety. All right, so one question before you leave. A lot of collapsed building, and you're an architect, and you've worked yeah. with a lot of these people. How do you intend to tackle that in Lagos uh, if elected governor? So that goes back to corruption as well. You see, what goes on in Lagos State, I mean, to get a building permit, so many bribes have to be paid. So even in the process of all of that, how do they now hold you accountable when they're collecting bribes for you to, to get, for you to get your paperwork to be able to do your buildings? So, like I said, transparency and accountability. We must start to make these systems a lot more autonomous without human interaction. 
minimal human interaction at least to get your permits right and then we must actually enforce you know punishments for people that do things and that don't go with those permits you see some somebody might get a permit to do a three-story building then go and build five-story buildings and because he's rich you never hear that he's been arrested but the person that owns and this happened you know there was a collapse recently yes. around the only yes. access yes. the owner of that building has not two people died the owner of that building has not have you read that he's been brought to prison or he's been not prison? seen him three days later i believe three days later there was a lady or a man who owns a school right in in parts of lagos are it's to come back to me and the fence that we're building collapsed and it killed two people as well uh a house girl and an evil girl and it collapsed now that guy was arrested that same day and you see this goes back to justice in this country it's justice for only the poor or people that don't have influence or no people right justice should apply to everybody and that's the kind of lagos that we're trying to have in lagos that works for the people that everybody's interest is protected and works for the many, not the few. Okay, uh, I wish we had more time. We would have gone on and you on. You always but, uh, have me back. Yes, we can always have you back. Thank you so much for coming through uh, this morning. And thank you, Lagos, for listening and, of course, calling us uh, to talk about the, la- the state of Lagos. And, of course, it's open. Uh, for every candidate who wants to come and share the mind of what they feel. I want to say thank you so much to uh, the candidate uh, for um, the LP, that's the Labour Party, who is with us this morning, to share his minds on the things that he wish or feels he can do for Lagos. Agbadebo, Patrick Rhodes, Vivo, you're welcome once again to our studios. Thank you. All right, I hope we, when we get to call you, you would uh, be able to come. I will be. I'll make time. All right. All right. Thank you so much. I heard you like your radio just like you like your coffee.